Chapter 59 Squid Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity her three tall, tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze, as three mild palms on a plain. And still, at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely, alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun-glade on the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in this profound hush of the visible sphere, a strange spectre was seen by Dagoo from the main masthead. In the distance a great white mass lazily rose, and, rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleamed before our prow like a snow-slide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly it subsided and sank, then once more arose, and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale. And yet is this Moby Dick, thought Dagoo? Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out, There! There again! There she breaches! Right ahead! The white whale! The white whale! Upon this the seamen rushed to the yard-arms, as in swarming times the bees rushed to the boughs. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Dagoo. Whether the flitting attendance of one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular whale he pursued, however this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass than with a quick intensity he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for a moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind— a vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct but undulated there on the billows, an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As, with a low sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again, Starbuck, still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, Almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. "'What was it, sir?' said Flask. "'The great live squid, which, they say, few whale-ships ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it.' But Ahab said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm-whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object— Certain it is, that a glimpse of it being so very unusual, 
that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld, that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form. Notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish the sperm whale his only food. For though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface, and only by inference is it that any one can tell of what precisely that food consists. At times, when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them thus exhibited, exceeding twenty and thirty feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the oceans, and that the sperm whale, unlike other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopidan may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it, as alternately rising and sinking, with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, to which, indeed, in certain external respects it would seem to belong, but only as the anak of the tribe. CHAPTER Sixty, THE LINE With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope-maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use, yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale-line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but, as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar in general by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years the manila rope has, in the American fishery, almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale-lines, for though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic, and, I will add, since there is an aesthetics in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but Manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment its one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of one hundred and twenty pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over two hundred fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm-pipe of a still, though, but so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow but the heart, or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downward through a block towards the tub, so as, in the act of coiling, to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, 
the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this, because these twin tubs, being so small, they fit more readily into the boat, and did not strain it so much. Whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter, and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness, for the bottom of the whaleboat is like critical ice, which will bear up under a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye-splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub, and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat, in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale, of course, is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from one boat to the other, though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end, almost in a single smoking minute, as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea, and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and, passing round the loggerhead there, is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing, and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunwales, to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows, and is then passed inside the boat again, and some ten or twenty fathoms, called box-line, being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft, and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon. But previous to that connection, the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale-line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsman they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman, for the first time, seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and, while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put into play like ringed lightnings. He cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you will hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whale-boat, when thus hung in hangman's nooses, and, like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck, as you may say. Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated wailing disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled, of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line, and lost. For when the line is darting out, 
to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you it is worse for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils because the boat is rocking like a cradle and you are pitched one way and the other without the slightest warning and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out again as the profound calm which only apparently precedes and prophesies of the storm is perhaps more awful than the storm itself for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm and contains it in itself as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion so the graceful repose of the line as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play this is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair but why say more all men live enveloped in whale lines all are born with halters round their necks but it is only when caught in the swift sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent subtle ever-present perils of life and if you be a philosopher though seated in a whale-boat you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than though seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side chapter sixty one stub kills a whale if to starbuck the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents to queequeg it was quite a different object when you see him quid said the savage honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat then you quick see him parm whale the next day was exceedingly still and sultry and with nothing special to engage them the pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea for this part of the indian ocean through which we were voyaging is not what whalemen call a lively ground that is it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises dolphins flying fish and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the rio de la plata or the inshore ground off peru it was my turn to stand at the foremast head and with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds to and fro i idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air no resolution could withstand it in that dreamy mood losing all consciousness at last my soul went out of my body though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum will long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn ere forgetfulness altogether came over me i had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars and for every swing that we made there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman the waves too nodded their indolent crests and across the wide trance of the sea east nodded to west and the sun over all suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes like vices my hands grasped the shrouds some invisible gracious agency preserved me with a shock i came back to life and lo close under our lee not forty fathoms off a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate his broad glossy back of an ethiopian hue glistening in the sun's rays like a mirror but lazily undulating in the trough of the sea and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet the whale looked like a portly burgher smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon but that pipe poor whale was thy last as if struck by some enchanter's wand the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness and more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel 
simultaneously with the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry, as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. "'Clear away the boats! Luff!' cried Ahab, and, obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes." The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale, and ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward. but with such a steady tranquillity, and making so few ripples as he swam, that, thinking after all he might not as yet be alarmed, Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers. So, seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air, and then sank out of sight like a tower swallowed up. "'There go flukes!' was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite was granted." After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and, being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honour of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped, and oars came loudly into play. And still puffing at his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out, that part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Footnote. It will be seen in some other place of what a very light substance the entire interior of the sperm whale's enormous head consists though apparently the most massive, it is by far the most buoyant part about him, so that with ease he elevates it in the air, and invariably does so when going at his utmost speed. Besides, such is the breadth of the upper part of the front of his head, and such the tapering cut-water formation of the lower part, that by obliquely elevating his head, he thereby may be said to transform himself from a bluff-bowed sluggish galliot into a sharp-pointed New York pilot boat. End of footnote. Starter! Starter, my men! Don't hurry yourselves. Take plenty of time. But starter! Starter like thunderclaps, that's all! cried Stubb, spluttering out the smoke as he spoke. Starter now! Give him the long and strong stroke, Tashtego! Starter, Tash, my boy! Starter all! But keep cool! keep cool cucumbers is the word easy easy only starter like grim death and grinning devils and raise the buried dead perpendicular out of their graves boys that's all starter woohoo why he screamed the gay header in reply raising some old war whoop to the skies as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Kihi, kihi! yelled Dagoo, straining forwards and backwards on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala, kulu! howled Queequeg as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of grenadier's steak. And thus, with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperados they tugged and they strained, till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tashtego! Give it to him! The harpoon was hurled. Stern all! The oarsmen backed water. The same moment something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, 
whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand-cloths or squares of quilted canvas sometimes worn at these times had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharped two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. "'Wet the line! Wet the line!' cried Stubb to the tub oarsman, him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed seawater into it. Footnote. Partly to show the indispensableness of this act, it may here be stated that in the old Dutch fishery a mop was used to dash the running line with water. In many other ships a wooden piggin or baler is set apart for that purpose. Your hat, however, is the most convenient. End of footnote. More turns were taken, so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water, like a shark all fins. Stubb and Tashtego here changed places, stem for stern, a staggering business truly in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from its now being more tight than a harp-string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water, the other the air, as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows, a ceaseless whirling eddy in her wake, and at the slightest motion from within, but even of a little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat, to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tashtego at the steering oar crouching almost double in order to bring down his centre of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacifics seemed past as they shot on their way, till at length the whale somewhat slackened his flight. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing round towards the whale all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish, at the word of command the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow, and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster, like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun playing upon this crimson pond in the sea sent back its reflection into every face, so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart hauling in upon his crooked lance by the line attached to it stubb straightened it again and again by a few rapid blows against the gunwale and then again and again sent it into the whale pull up pull up he now cried to the bowsman as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath pull up close to and the boat ranged along the fish's flank when reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish, and kept it there, carefully churning and churning, as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking, ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish. And now it is struck for starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry the monster horribly wallowed in his blood overwrapped himself in impenetrable mad boiling spray so that the imperiled craft instantly dropping astern had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight 
into the clear air of day. And now, abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout-hole, with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frighted air, and, falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. "'He's dead, Mr. Stubb,' said Tashtego. "'Yes, both pipes smoked out.' And withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and, for a moment, stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. CHAPTER 62 THE DART A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whale-boat pushes off from the ship, with the headsman or whale-killer as temporary steersman, and the harpooner or whale-fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner oar. Now, it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of twenty or thirty feet. But however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and intrepid exclamations. And what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass, while all the other muscles are strained and half-started, what that is none know but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot bawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one at the same time. In this straining, bawling state, then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, Stand up and give it to him. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn round on his centre halfway, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and, with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most wanted? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat-header and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft, to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and every one else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last, he should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before-described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from out of idleness, and not from out of toil. CHAPTER 63 THE CROTCH Out of the trunk the branches grow, out of them the twigs, 
So, in productive subjects, grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow, for the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked, barbed end slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily from its rest as a backwoodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line, the object being this, to dart them both if possible, one instantly after the other, into the same whale, so that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still retain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances. But it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, hence that weapon must at all events be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat, somehow and somewhere, else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water it accordingly is in such cases, the spare coils of box-line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat in most instances prudently practicable. But this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again, until the whale is fairly captured, and a corpse. Consider, now, how it must be, in the case of four boats, all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when, owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him, for, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend on to the line, should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate, passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. CHAPTER 64 STUBB'S SUPPER Stubb's whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men, with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it, in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along, as if laden with pig-lead in bulk." Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, 
Yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction, or impatience, or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And, though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought, from the sound of the Pequod's decks, that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck, and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored, tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows. The whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessels, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. Footnote. A little item may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold which the ship has upon the whale, when moored alongside, is by the flukes or tail, and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small strong line is prepared, with a wooden float at its outer end, and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now having girdled the whale the chain is readily made to follow suit, and being slipped along the body is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail, at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. End of footnote. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in, that the stead Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale, as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak! A steak! Ere I sleep! You, Dagu, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small! Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not as a general thing, according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before receiving the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen, black waters, and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge, globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls, remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark that they thus leave in the whale may best be likened to a hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. 
though amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea fight sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them and though while the valiant butchers over the deck table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasselled the sharks also with their jewel-hilted mouths are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat and though were you to turn the whole affair upside down it would still be pretty much the same thing that is to say a shocking sharkish business enough for all parties and though sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the atlantic symmetrically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere or a dead slave to be decently buried and though one or two other like instances might be set down touching the set terms places and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast yet there is no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers and in gayer or more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale moored by night to a whale ship at sea if you have never seen that sight then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil worship and the expediency of conciliating the devil but as yet stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips cook cook where's that old fleece he cried at length widening his legs still further as if to form a more secure base for his supper and at the same time darting his fork into the dish as if stabbing with his lance cook you cook sail this way cook the old black not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour came shambling along from his galley for like many old blacks there was something the matter with his knee pans which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans this old fleece as they called him came shuffling and limping along assisting his step with his tongs which after a clumsy fashion were made of straightened iron hoops this old ebony floundered along and in obedience to the word of command came to a dead stop on the opposite side of stubb's sideboard when with both hands folded before him and resting on his two-legged cane he bowed his arched back still further over at the same time sideways inclining his head so as to bring his best ear into play cook said stubb rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth don't you think this steak is rather overdone you've been beating this steak too much cook it's too tender don't i always say that to be good a whale steak must be tough there are those sharks now over the side don't you see they prefer it tough and rare what a shindy they are kicking up cook go and talk to em tell em they are welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation but they must keep quiet blast me if i can hear my own voice away cook and deliver my message here take this lantern snatching one from his sideboard now then go and preach to em sullenly taking the offered lantern old fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks and then with one hand dropping his light low over the sea so as to get a good view of his congregation with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice began addressing the sharks while stubb softly crawling behind overheard all that was said fellow critters i's ordered here to say dat you must stop dat damn noise there you hear stop dat damn smackin of de lips massa stubb say dat you can fill your damn bellies up to de hatchings but by gore you must stop dat damn racket cook here interposed stubb accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder cook why damn your eyes you mustn't swear that way when you're preaching that's no way to convert sinners cook 
Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, cook. Go on, go on. Well, then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax em to it. Try that. And Fleece continued. Though you is all sharks, and by nature very voracious, yet I say to you, fellow critters, dat dat voraciousness, top dat damn slappin' of de tail. How you tink to hear, s'pose you keep up such de damn slappin' and bitin' dare? Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him, I won't have that swearing. Talk to em gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much for. That is nature, and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the pint. You is shark, sartin. But if you govern the shark in you, why then you be angel. For all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed. Now look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil. A helpin' yourselves from dat whale. Don't be tearin' de blubber out o' your neighbor's mout, I say. Is not one shark dood right as tudder to dat whale? And by gore, none o' you has de right to dat whale. Dat whale belong to someone else. I know some o' you has berry brig mouth, brigger than others. But den de big mouth sometimes had de small bellies, so that de brigness of de mouth is not to swallow with, but to bid off de blubber for de small fry of sharks that can't get into de scrounge to help themselves. Well done, old fleece, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. De damn willins will keep a scourgin and a slappin each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use a preachin to such damn gluttons as you call em till their bellies is full, and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get em full, they won't hear you then, for then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on de coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul I am about of the same opinion. So give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cursed fellow critters, kick up the damnedest row as ever you can, fill your damn bellies till they burst, and then die. Now, cook, said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan, stand just where you stood before there, over against me, and pay particular attention. All attention, said Fleece, again stooping over his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, Cook? What dat to do with the take? said the old black testily. Silence! How old are you, Cook? About ninety, they say, he gloomily muttered. And you have lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, cook, and don't know yet how to cook a whale steak, rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so that morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, cook? Hind a hatchway, in ferry boat, going over to Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, cook. "'Didn't I say to Roanoke country?' he cried sharply. "'No, you didn't, Cook. But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet.' "'Bress my soul if I cook another one,' he growled, angrily turning round to depart. "'Come back here, Cook. Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there, and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it, and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cooked take I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, 
said Stubb, squaring himself once more. "'Do you belong to the church?' "'Passed one once in Cape Town,' said the old man sullenly. "'And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, where you doubtless overheard a holy parson addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow-creatures, have you, Cook? And yet you come here, and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh?' said Stubb. "'Where do you expect to go to, Cook?' "'Go to bed very soon.' he mumbled, half-turning as he spoke. Avast! Heave to! I mean, when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old brack man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he hisself won't go nowhere, but some bressed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they fetched Elijah? and fetch him where up dare said fleece holding his tongs straight over his head and keeping it there very solemnly so then you expect to go up into our main top do you cook when you are dead but don't you know the higher you climb the colder it gets main top eh didn't say that at all said fleece again in the sulks you said up there didn't you and now look yourself, and see where your tongs are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lubber's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there, except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but it must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders, do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand, and clap the other atop your heart when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That your heart, there? That's your gizzard! Aloft, aloft! That's it, now you have it. Hold it there now, and pay attention. All attention, said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, Cook, you see this whale-stake of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale-stake for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do, so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the stake in one hand, and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, do you hear? And now to-morrow, Cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, Cook. There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper to-morrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail, then. Hello! Stop! Make a bow before you go. Avast! Heaving again. Whale-balls for breakfast. Don't forget. Wish, by gore, whale eat him, stead of him eat whale. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Chapter 65 the whale as a dish. That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like Stubb, eat him by his own light, as you may say, this seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France, and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry the Eighth's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced, might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. 
The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that, among his hunters at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly one hundred feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men, like Stubb, nowadays partake of cooked whales. But the Eskimos are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales, and have rare old vintages of prime old train oil. Zogranda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the mouldy scraps of whales, which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble, being brown and crisp, and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' doughnuts or oily cooks when fresh. They have such an edible look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it into some other substance and then partaking of it. In the long try-watches of the night it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship-biscuit into the huge oil-pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casket of the skull is broken into with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings, they are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delectable mess, in flavor somewhat resembling calves' heads, which is quite a dish among some epicures and every one knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calves' brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which indeed requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not, perhaps, entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it, too, by its own light, but no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it, if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine, it will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pâté de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? 
Look at your knife handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmand, dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose? With a feather of the same fowl. And with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66 The Shark Massacre when, in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that until that time anchor watches shall be kept, that is, two and two, for an hour each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that were he left so for six hours, say, on a stretch, little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely abound, their wondrous veracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades, a procedure notwithstanding which, in some instances, only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case with the Pequod sharks, though to be sure any man unaccustomed to such sights, to have looked over her side that night, would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese, and those sharks the maggots in it. Nevertheless, upon Stubb setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, and when, accordingly, Queequeg and a forecastle seaman came on deck, no small excitement was created among the sharks, for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side, and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid seas, these two mariners, darting their long whaling spades, kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks, by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls, seemingly their only vital part. Footnote. The whaling spade used for cutting in is made of the very best steel, is about the bigness of a man's spread hand, and in general shape corresponds to the garden implement after which it is named, only its sides are perfectly flat, and its upper end considerably narrower than the lower. This weapon is always kept as sharp as possible, and when being used is occasionally honed, just like a razor. In its socket a stiff pole, from twenty to thirty feet long, is inserted for a handle. End of footnote. But in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped not only at each other's disembowelments, but, like flexible bows, bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth, to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures. A sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones, after what might be called the individual life had departed. Killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin, one of these sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. "'Queequeg no care what God made him shark,' said the savage agonizingly lifting his hand up and down, whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but to God what made shark must be one damn engine. 
Chapter 67 Cutting In It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed. Ex officio professors of Sabbath breaking are all whalemen. The ivory Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up ten thousand red oxen to the sea gods. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles, among other ponderous things comprising a cluster of blocks generally painted green, and which no single man can possibly lift, this vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top, and firmly lashed to the lower masthead, the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck. The end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass, and the huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale. To this block the great blubber-hook, weighing some one hundred pounds, was attached, and now, suspended in stages over the side, Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook, just above the nearest of the two side fins. This done, a broad semicircular line is cut round the hole, the hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew, striking up a wild chorus, now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass when instantly the entire ship careens over on her side, every bolt in her starts like the nail-heads of an old house in frosty weather. She trembles, quivers, and nods her frighted mastheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows, till at last a swift startling snap is heard, with a great swash the ship rolls upward and backwards from the whale, and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now, as the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so it is stripped off from the body precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is thus peeled off, and indeed by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft, till its upper end grazes the main top. The men at the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two the prodigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if let down from the sky, and every one present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long keen weapon called a boarding-sword and, watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked, so as to retain a hold upon the blubber, in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass, and with a few sidelong desperate lunging slicings severs it completely in twain so that while the short lower part is still fast the long upper strip called a blanket piece swings clear and is all ready for lowering the heavers forward now resume their song and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale the other is slowly slackened away and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath into an unfurnished parlour called the blubber room into this twilight apartment sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of pleated serpents and thus the work proceeds the two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously both whale and windlass heaving the heavers singing the blubber room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ships straining, and all hands swearing occasionally, by way of assuaging the general friction. 
Chapter 68 The Blanket I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat, and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from eight or ten to twelve and fifteen inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, yet in point of fact these are no arguments against such a presumption, because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber, and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens, but becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale-books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. The same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature, as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale, then, when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of one hundred barrels of oil, and when it is considered that, in quantity, or rather weight, that oil, in its express state, is only three-fourths, and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose mere integument yields such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons for the net weight of only three-quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it, as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical, that is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of the pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic-marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back, and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches, altogether of an irregular, random aspect. 
I should say that those New England rocks on the sea coast, which Agassi imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces, called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant, for the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as in a real blanket or counterpane, or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout? True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in those hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg, as a traveller in winter would bask before an inn-fire, whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood, freeze his blood, and he dies. How wonderful it is, then, except after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterward, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found glued in amber. But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality, and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. Oh, man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou, too, remain warm among ice. Do thou, too, live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. Keep thy blood fluid at the pole. Like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons, a temperature of thine own. But how easy, and how hopeless, to teach these fine things! Of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's! Of creatures, how few vast as the whale! Chapter 69. The Funeral. Haul in the chains, let the carcass go astern. The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulchre. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls, whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast white headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seems square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen, beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, wafted by the joyous breezes, that great mass of death floats on and on, till lost in infinite perspectives. There's a most doleful and most mocking funeral, the sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it. 
but upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pounce. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free! Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare. Espied by some timid man-of-war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun and the white spray heaving high against it, straightway the whale's unharming corpse with trembling fingers is set down in the log. Shoals, rocks, and breakers hereabouts, beware! And for years afterwards, perhaps, ships shun the place, leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum, because their leader originally leaped there when a stick was held. There's your law of precedence, there's your utility of traditions, there's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs never bottomed on the earth, and not now even hovering in the air. There's orthodoxy. Thus, while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes, in his death his ghost becomes a powerless panic to the world. Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one, and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson, who believe in them. CHAPTER SEVENTY THE SPHINX It should not have been omitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the Leviathan, he was beheaded. Now, the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves, and not without reason. Consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck. On the contrary, where his head and body seem to join, there, in that very place, is the thickest part of him. Remember also that the surgeon must operate from above, some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject, and that subject almost hidden in a discoloured, rolling, and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea. Bear in mind, too, that under these untoward circumstances, he has to cut many feet deep in the flesh, and in that subterraneous matter, without so much as getting one single peep into the ever-contracting gash thus made, he must skilfully steer clear of all adjacent interdicted parts, and exactly divide the spine at a critical point, hard by its insertion into the skull. Do you not marvel, then, at Stubb's boast that he demanded but ten minutes to behead a sperm whale? When first severed, the head is dropped astern, and held there by a cable till the body is stripped. That done, if it belong to a small whale, it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of. But with a full-grown leviathan this is impossible, for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk and completely to suspend such a burden as that, even by the immense tackles of a whaler, this were as vain a thing as to attempt weighing a Dutch barn in jeweler's scales. The Pequod's whale being decapitated and the body stripped, the head was hoisted against the ship's side, about halfway out of the sea, so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its native element. And there, with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it, by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead, and every yard-arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves, there that blood-dripping head hung to the Pequod's waist, like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck. An intense copper calm, like a universal yellow lotus, was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab, alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarter-deck, he paused to gaze over the side. Then, slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubb's long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation. 
and striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mass, placed its other end crutchwise under one arm, and so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. "'Speak, thou vast and venerable head,' muttered Ahab, "'which, though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there looks hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where Bell or Diver never went, has slept by many a sailor's side, where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, true to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck, for hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw and his murderers still sailed on unharmed, while swift lightnings shivered the neighboring ship that would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho! cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. "'Aye, well now, that's cheering,' cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself, while whole thunderclouds swept aside from his brow. "'That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. "'Where away?' Three points on the starboard bow, sir, and bringing down her breeze to us. "'Better and better, man. Would now St. Paul would come along that way.' and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O oh, nature, and O oh, soul of man, how far beyond all utterances are your linked analogies! Not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. Chapter 71 The Jeroboam Story Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship, and soon the Pequod began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale-ship, but as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Pequod could not hope to reach her, so the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here be it said that, like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale fleet have each a private signal, all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached, and every captain provided with it. Thereby the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean, even at considerable distances and with no small facility. The Pequod's signal was at last responded to by the strangers setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nantucket. Squaring her yards, she bore down, ranged a beam under the Pequod's lee, and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh, but as the side-ladder was being rigged by Starbuck's order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from the boat's stern, in token of that proceeding being entirely unnecessary. It turned out that the Jeroboam had a malignant epidemic on board, and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Pequod's company. For though himself and boat's crew remained untainted, and though his ship was half a rifle shot off, and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, 
yet conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Pequod. But this did by no means prevent all communications. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pequod, as she heavily forged through the sea, for by this time it blew very fresh, with her main topsail aback. Though, indeed, at times, by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave, the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but would be soon skilfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of singular appearance, even in that wild whaling life where individual notabilities make up all totalities. He was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first descried, Stubb had exclaimed, "'That's he! That's he!' the long-togged scaramouche the town hose company told us of stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the jeroboam and a certain man among her crew some time previous when the pequod spoke the town ho according to this account and what was subsequently learned it seemed that the scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the jeroboam his story was this he had originally been nurtured among the crazy society of Neskuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet, in their cracked secret meetings having several times descended from heaven by way of a trap-door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial which he carried in his vest pocket, but which, instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady, common-sense exterior, and offered himself as a green-hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. They engaged him, but straight away upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the archangel Gabriel, and commanded the captain to jump overboard, he published his manifesto, whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the isles of the sea, and vicar-general of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium, united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew, with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased, the incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him. But apprised that that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port, the archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition, in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him, if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan. Nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would, so that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command, nor should it be stayed but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, 
and some of them fawned before him in obedience to his instructions sometimes rendering him personal homage as to a god such things may seem incredible but however wondrous they are true nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others but it is time to return to the pequod i fear not thy epidemic man said ahab from the bulwarks to captain mayhew who stood in the boat's stern come on board but now gabriel started to his feet think think of the fevers yellow and bilious beware of the horrible plague gabriel gabriel cried captain mayhew thou must either but that instant a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead and its seethings drowned all speech hast thou seen the white whale demanded ahab when the boat drifted back think think of thy whale-boat stoven and sunk beware of the horrible tale i tell thee again gabriel that but again the boat tore ahead as if dragged by fiends nothing was said for some moments while a succession of riotous waves rolled by which by one of those occasional caprices of the seas were tumbling not heaving it meantime the hoisted sperm whale's head jogged about very violently and gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant when this interlude was over captain mayhew began a dark story concerning moby dick not however without frequent interruptions from gabriel whenever his name was mentioned and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him it seemed that the jeroboam had not long left home when upon speaking a whale-ship her people were reliably apprised of the existence of moby dick and the havoc he had made greedily sucking in this intelligence gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale in case the monster should be seen in his gibbering insanity pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the shaker god incarnated the shakers receiving the bible but when some year or two afterward moby dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads macy the chief mate burned with ardor to encounter him and the captain himself being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat with them he pushed off and after much weary pulling and many perilous unsuccessful onsets he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast meantime gabriel ascending to the main royal masthead was tossing one arm in frantic gestures and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity now while macy the mate was standing up in his boat's bow and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale and essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance lo a broad white shadow rose from the sea by its quick fanning motion temporarily taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen next instant the luckless mate so full of furious life was smitten bodily into the air and making a long arc in his descent fell into the sea at a distance of about fifty yards not a chip of the boat was harmed nor a hair of any oarsman's head but the mate forever sank it is well to parenthesize here that of the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated oftener the boat's bow is knocked off or the thigh-board in which the headsman stands is torn from its place and accompanies the body but strangest of all is the circumstance that in more instances than one when the body has been recovered not a single mark of violence is discernible the man being stark dead the whole calamity with the falling form of macy was plainly descried from the ship raising a piercing shriek the vile the vile gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale 
This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy, which any one might have done, and so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nameless terror to the ship. Mayhew, having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer, to which Ahab answered, Aye. Straightway then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward pointed finger, Think! Think of the blasphemer! Dead and down there! Beware of the blasphemer's end! Ahab stolidly turned aside, then said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just bethought me of my letter-bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers, if I mistake it not. Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale-ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. Thus most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull, spotted green mould, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter Death himself might well have been the postboy. "'Canst not read it?' cried Ahab. "'Give it me, man.' "'Aye, aye. It's but a dim scrawl. What's this?' As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting-spade pole, and, with his knife, slightly split the end to insert the letter there, and in that way hand it to the boat, without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab, holding the letter, muttered, Mr. Harry, Harry is, yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's penny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew, but let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself cried Gabriel to Ahab. Thou art soon going that way. Curses throttle thee, yelled Ahab. Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it. And, taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole, and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that, as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat-knife, and, impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As, after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair.